Welcome to Notes from the North's first Vikings offseason podcast. Today, we have a special guest, Brian from Blitzology.com. We referenced his work a couple episodes ago, and we're thankful to have been joined by him this week. So without further ado, we'll throw it over to the interview. We hope you all enjoy it. Welcome to Notes from the North with Kyle and Sam. We'd like to introduce our first guest ever on Notes from the North, and we've got uh, a great one. Uh, Brian from Blitzology is here with us, and uh, he's going to help us break down the Vikings and provide a real expert perspective. So, Brian, welcome to Notes from the North, and love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and who you are. Thanks. I'm, I'm pumped to be here. Uh, I'm a college football coach. That's what I do. Uh, the last 16 seasons, been all over the country. Uh, worked in the Northeast, worked in the Midwest, worked in the Southwest. Now I live in the South. I live in Florida. Um, coached at a bunch of different levels from D3 to junior college to Division II. Um, and been a defensive coordinator, a bunch of different stops. Uh, most of my background is on the back end coaching the secondary. Uh, but I've coached multiple positions on defense. And I started writing a website uh, about 11 years ago, I guess. And it was meant to just be a resource for coaches. I thought uh, there was a lacking um, a big, big space in the, in the market share of people talking intelligently about blitzing. So, uh, you know, I came up with this website, Blitzology, and we were going to talk a little bit more about the ins and outs of pressure. It turned out a lot of people were interested in it that weren't just football coaches. I mean, it's really blown up into something that was not expected. Um, there's guys like you guys that are content creators that want to talk about their teams and they're interested in knowing about the scheme in and out. Um, there's guys who are interested in fantasy football and gambling and playing Madden. Um, there's also just diehard fans that want to know more about it. Um, and then, of course, the biggest market share of my, you know, the readership of the site is football coaches, high school football coaches and college football coaches. Uh, and it's been a cool experience to connect with all those people. Um, what I share is mostly just content that is different blitzes, different coverages that go with blitzes, mostly pass rush and, and that type of thing. But I get into some other stuff and how we actually got connected was you guys read an article I wrote about um, offensive uh, coaches scripting the beginning of the game. And you guys talked about that a little bit on, on one of your podcasts and tweeted it out. And so I thought, well, I've not heard of this podcast. Let me go listen to what this is. So I listened to the first that podcast and heard what you guys were talking about. And then I, I you know, we got connected through the magic of social media. And then here we are. Um, so it's uh, very excited to be here to talk about the Vikings. That's amazing. Uh, that's uh Okay, so that, that was going to be one of my follow-up questions was what kind of your uh, – so it's one thing to say you're a defensive coordinator. Um, you know, so like Mike Zimmer, for instance, he's the head coach, and he's kind, of, he's kind of the defensive coordinator. He calls the plays. But, you know, but he's like the corner whisperer. That's kind of his thing. So I did want to check in to see, you know, the area of defense, you kind of – your expertise. And so it's on the back end. And so we'll certainly be – well, I have a few questions certainly for, for you in terms of those young corners – and uh, kind of what you're seeing with the secondary. But before we get there, I thought it'd be interesting. I mean, uh, did you play football growing up? Uh, before you got into coaching, what was your what's your background in football before coaching? Sure. I uh, so I played um, like most kids in the United States, right? Like I started off in youth football and had a great time playing that stuff. Played youth ball and then into junior high and in the city I'm from, uh, junior high football. All the junior high kids are broken up into four teams and then we all hate each other. Uh, so you don't actually play for like a specific junior high team. You play for a youth league team. So I played for the, the Jacksonville area youth league Rams, uh, which was obviously rivals with the other teams, the Steelers, the, uh, uh, the Raiders were our big rival in that particular, uh, setup. And then, um, high school football, uh, small town high school football in Illinois. Um, and it's a big deal, right? The town is very serious about it and the, the rivalries are very serious and, you know, it, most of the male population in the high school plays. Like that's part of what you do, even if you're not going to play afterward. Um, I wasn't a dominant player. Uh, I'm not a huge dude. Uh, I was a very average football player at best. I played Division Three, which is non-scholarship football in the United States. Um, so I definitely was not on the, uh, the high end of football talent. I wasn't playing at Alabama or Clemson or something like that. Um, but I loved playing, and I wanted to keep playing. Got my degree, got out, started coaching, um, and it really just all snowballed from there. I I've definitely been a much more successful coach than I was player. So we'll put it that way. And yeah. I played in the secondary. I played DB. I played uh, safety and a little bit of nickel. Uh, but I was always a, a secondary player. Uh, unless you count 
sixth and seventh grade where I had grown before everybody else and I was a dominant outside linebacker at the end and I was uh, convinced I was going to be Derek Thomas. Just convinced. And then well, I didn't grow again, so it didn't really work out for me. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it did look promising for a brief window. Unfortunately, it didn't pan out, but you had a you had a sliver of hope there. And so, I mean, that's got to count for something, right? And so I will say, uh, you know, maybe before we get to the second down, kind of get into the meat potatoes of um, kind of why you're on here, you know, is this expertise and talking about defense. Uh, I should pump that article again because I talked about it uh, a podcast or two ago. I mean, though the opening script, it's, uh, it's fascinating to see what an offensive coordinator does, how they're planning on attacking that defense. And I would really encourage anyone who wants to understand football better to, to give it a read. Yeah, head, head over to blitzology.com and, uh, and, and give it a shot. I think you'll be uh, – it definitely – I think the casual fan probably wouldn't realize uh, some of the strategy and the game planning. But maybe with that said, I'll hand it over to Sam, and uh, he'll hit us with that second down question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and just to touch on that point, Kyle and I messaged back and forth between the games, and I actually made a comment without knowing a whole lot of the, the terminology kind of about how amazing this, this opening drive was, and, and that's when Kyle started talking about this opening script. And so I think even just from a casual fan perspective, it's been neat to look in a little bit more and, and learn a little bit more about uh, some of the planning that goes into to these games. And so I've been able to check out the site and learn a little bit more. And yeah, it's a it's a great spot for for any type of fan. You said there's a multitude of of groups that have been able to use it. Um, but yeah, transitioning to second down, uh, one of the things that we really wanted to talk about, and I think it's really apparent from the season this year, was the interconnectedness of defensive football. And so, especially the Minnesota defense this year had a lot of injuries on the on the front seven. And I guess basically wanted to ask you, what does it mean, or like? Explaining the the interconnectedness of, of the way defense works in terms of the, that the D line and then the linebackers and the young secondary that the Vikings have, um, yeah, yeah, it's completely interconnected. I mean, pass rush is a coverage element, and that is something that eludes some casual fans. They don't they think of them as separate entities. They're not. They're interconnected. If you rush three and drop eight, your coverage should be significantly better than more aggressive coverages that have fewer people covering. But the problem is when you rush three, you're not going to get to the quarterback nearly as uh, quickly. And he's going to move around in the pocket and buy time. Routes have the opportunity to convert and get into open spaces. And things can happen to you when you do that. So then you get into, okay, we're going to rush four, which is a common principle amongst football teams across, uh, you know, every level of football. They like the idea of rush four, drop seven, because it creates some semblance of balance. Get to the quarterback in an effective amount of time, but also still have enough coverage to be able to run a lot of the traditional coverages that people are familiar with. You get in to bring in an extra rusher, you start talking about bringing five. Now, all of a sudden, you're kind of limited in what coverages you're going to run. You have your fire zone family of coverages, which is three under three deep, four under two deep sorts of coverages. You have your man free coverages where we're going to play man and put a guy in the post. Um, and then you have some hybridized coverages where you're going to play quarters on one side and man on another side and those sorts of things. And then you get into your six man pressures and seven man pressures where you're basically saying we're going to play cover zero man or we're going to play some two under three deep type of zone elements. But for the most part, you, you start to limit what coverages exist as you bring more pressure. But the idea is always as we bring more pressure, the ball cannot be held as long. The routes cannot be the same things. So it's all tied together. And if the pass rush isn't there, it makes the coverage significantly worse. And if the coverage isn't very good, the pass rush makes not a matter because you could have the best front four in America and you're not going to get to the quarterback on time because they're getting the ball out and getting the ball to wide open people or they're getting the ball into very reasonable, makeable throws routinely. That type of stuff is is just a fact. I mean, it's a reality and it changes who you are when you don't have the same pass rush perspective. I mean, losing Hunter on their defensive line in Minnesota changes everything. He's a 14 and a half sack player in 2019. You cannot manufacture 14 and a half sacks by plugging in a replacement player. They would have to go get a top tier Pro Bowl level D lineman to replace that with one person. So who's going to replace those numbers just from losing a great player, right? And so those are the kind of things that happen. Your pass rush, I mean, they went from being a 48 sack team to a 22 sack team. Right. And so simple math there, 20 sacks, well, 14 and a half of those are one dude, one guy. 
you know, and then Griffin was obviously another, I think, eight or so in 2019. So they literally lost pretty much all those sacks and two human beings. I mean, that's, that's the nature of the game too. It's a personnel driven league. And so if you don't have the people to do it, it changes everything. So people will talk a lot about the personnel when it comes to a coverage corner, for example. But the same thing applies to a great pass rusher, right? It changes your entire outcome. And a good example of like a four down place that things really change. If you go look at San Francisco, they lost to Forrest Buckner to free agency. He ended up signing with the Colts and the Colts pass rush really skyrocketed because he brought nine and a half sacks to a team that already had some edge rush juice. And now they got an interior rusher who could really go get it. And in San Francisco, they not only lost Buckner, but they also lost Bosa to the early injury, and they had to manufacture. So they had to start bringing a lot of pressure stuff. They had to do a lot more aggressive things than their traditional rush floor, which is a testament to their coaching staff. They did an awesome job generating pressure that didn't really exist naturally, but it's the nature of the deal. When you lose a great player, it's really hard to replace that. It doesn't matter whether you drafted a first-round guy to replace him or not. Some guys are hard to replace, and 14 and a half sacks is hard to replace, and that puts a ton of stress on the back end. And now, can those guys hold up in coverage long enough for the pressure to get home? And if you look at the 22 sacks they did have, I, by my count, I had nine of those sacks were with pressure. So they were bringing five or six to get home in those 22 sacks. So they weren't just doing it with four very often. And they aren't a big simulated pressure team, so they're not bringing a lot of non-traditional four-man pass rush stuff. They're rushing with the down four, or they're adding extra guys into the pass rush. And because of that, I mean, they had to manufacture 50% of their sacks this season for a sack total that wasn't overly impressive to begin with. And that is a byproduct of like they're just not getting home. And so that puts a ton of stress on the coverage people on the back end because now, again, you get more aggressive to try and get those sacks. You also are making the coverage more isolated. You're not getting as much help. You don't get to just have seven guys dropping coverage and a great pass rush to bring five and six. And so they, they definitely have all of those challenges. That's totally fair. You know, seeing, I mean, you talked about Daniel Hunter, and he was one I was going to bring up, obviously. And then, you know, the other one that I think it was Michael Pierce, who uh, they signed as a free agent. He, he hasn't actually played it down with the Vikings yet, but they signed him to replace Linval Joseph. You know, and so having, like, a true one technique who can absorb those blocks and then having a true number one defensive end, I mean, just even if, even if we forget about, like, forget the secondary for just a moment, how much of a difference does it make just for the other defensive linemen, because, I mean, does this create a domino effect where now, you know, the offense has to now account for these true number one elite players, like you said, Hunter, 14 half sacks. I mean, he did that in 2019. They had the same number in 20. So 2018, 2019 were both 14 and a half. And so, you know, you subtract those two players. How much more difficult now does it become for the other defensive tackles and the other defensive ends because they don't have these other guys beside them? becomes a huge factor. I mean, I, all of a sudden, pass protection isn't worried about specifically accounting for, for a, a guy. Like, you need to account for Hunter. He's a guy you need to know where the heck he's at and how you plan to block him. And so, now all of a sudden, you don't have that. You don't have this situation where it's a guy who can just win one-on-one. And so then you're trying to cook up how are we going to manufacture, you know, are we going to use pass rush twists and things like that. The Vikings don't use a ton of pass rush stunt things. They're much more straight straight line pass rush team uh, with pass lane, pass rush lane distribution. That's pretty traditional, right? You expect a D tackle to rush in an interior pass rush range. He's not going to all of a sudden become an edge rusher. Well, again, you're getting what you're getting in those, without those edge guys going to get their sacks, going to get their pressures, you're, you're running into some troubles. They also had issues on the defensive line in terms of stopping the run. And that hurts your pass rush opportunities too. That the only issue wasn't just the pass rush. It's easy to get caught up at looking at uh, sacks as a stat. Pressure is significantly more complex than sacks. How often do you move the quarterback off the spot? How much do you make that quarterback uncomfortable? Because you could have a great pressure day, but zero sacks as a team. Um, That's a totally reasonable outcome in the NFL. Or you might have had a three sack day. Uh, and it wasn't really that impressive in terms of pass rush. You just had three really good individual plays or whatever the case may be. Uh, but they've had, in a, you know, I mean, the inability to stop first and 10 run sets you up for more second down medium situations. It sets you up for being on schedule, which means you don't get those third and obvious pass. And the Vikings have a nice pass rush package for third and long, but you got to get somebody to third and long if you're going to use it. That's the problem, right? You've got to get them into that situation to go bring all those exotic things to get in there double mugged a gap look, which has been very successful for Zimmer 
for a long time in the NFL. Well, to get to that look, you got to get them in third and long. And that's been part of their their struggle with the defensive line is that it, it affects everything. And it also affects your linebackers. And we have a really good linebacker in Kendricks. If he's getting players climbing to the second level because they are, do not feel obligated to double team block uh, a defensive tackle, you've got a big problem on your hands. And that's why a guy like DeForest Buckner is so valuable in one of these schemes. He goes from three technique in San Francisco to three technique in Indianapolis. He's one of the most dominant players in the NFL. And so you better account for him. And that keeps linebackers clean, there's no doubt. Well, if you just look at the Vikings this season, who inside elicited that type of response from the opposing team in the interior D-line? The answer is nobody. I mean, it's just the reality. I don't think anybody was was doing that. If you look at the run game stuff, I mean, they had 122 plays that they gave up a rush of six or more. That's a lot of plays on the season to give up a six-yard run or greater uh, on the year. And even in the Detroit Lions game towards the end of the year, I mean, some of the runs – Adrian Peterson ripped off like a 38 yard run on a counter. And I mean, the bottom line is it was one of those deals where they created numerical even for the offense, right? You're, you're not plus one defensively, you're even up. And that requires you defensively to have somebody shed a block. And obviously it didn't happen because it went for 38 yards, but those are the situations where some of that is just personnel driven. If Kendricks is playing, does he beat the block of that second puller? Yeah, probably. Cause he's a really good player. And that's part of how these, schemes function because if you think about an eight-man front defense for example when the vikings play their one high package they have a post safety they have eight in the box and most of the time that means the offense can't block a guy unless they use quarterback run or read scheme stuff they got an unblocked defender so now the offense is trying to check to run away from the unblocked guy and it leaves you with a lot of even numerical matchups because the offense is good enough to check it away from the unblocked player but then they have to also block those people. So the defense is constructing, okay, the plus one player is over here. They're going to run away from that, and they're running at our best players, right? That sort of mentality. Well, again, they got one of those situations, and the guys who needed to fit that and make play, they won on offense, and that's part of the NFL. The other side's got good players too, so you tip your cap and say, okay, they won that one. The problem is your percentages need to be better than what they were in Minnesota this year. you gotta, you got to win a bigger percentage of those even matchup plays. And they weren't. And that comes down to personnel. It's just that simple. You have to, and either the guys you got got to get better and do it, or you got to get different guys. That's, that's just the nature of how football works. Right. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I can remember, I don't know if you read the athletic, but uh, Arif Hassan is, uh, um, I mean, in terms of sophisticated Vikings coverage, you'd be hard pressed to find better, someone better than him. And I can remember him talking about how part of Zimmer, you know, one of Zimmer's strategies is that you on defense, you present the, the offense with a problem, trusting that they're going to then try and have a solution. And then you you undermine their solution. So what you're saying with you have the extra man on the box, trusting that they're then going to go away from the extra man, but maybe into your best players. Well, you, you know, that requires you to have those elite players, like you're saying, you know, and that it's that old football saying it's about the Jimmys and the Joes, not the X's and the O's. And so it's really tough, I think, for Zim without the Jimmys and the Joes. And so the question for you then, maybe before uh, the next one, is to say, if you get Anthony Barr back, you get Eric Hendricks back, you get Michael Pierce back, you get Daniel Hunter back, would it be reasonable to say, okay, so we insert these four players into this exact same defense, how much of a difference can that make realistically? I, I mean, just, just right off the top of my head, Okay, so this is a seven and nine football team, right? Yep. And if you go back and you just highlight three games of interest from the season, week six, they lose to the Falcons, right? Yep. Week 11, they lose to the Cowboys. And week 15, they lose to the Bears. All very winnable games against either fringe playoff or non playoff teams. They have those guys playing. They could easily have won all three of those games. And now you're talking about a team that's a 10 win football team, 10 and 16, and clearly a playoff team without any question mark that they're in the playoffs. Would they have been a playoff team if they had those guys? Yeah, probably. That's my answer. Yes, they're a playoff team. But then the deeper question is, when you talk about roster construction and what you're trying to accomplish, is this roster in their team a playoff team, a fringe playoff team, or are they a legitimate Super Bowl contender? That's two completely different questions. So it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Can they make the playoffs with who they have right now and doing exactly what they did? Yeah, this is a playoff team. And I think people don't really realize how close they were. Right. I mean, literally, the, if they went two out of those three games, they're in. They were nine and 17 and they would have trumped 
uh, they would have jumped the Bears. So I think looking at that and saying it's really not that far away from being a playoff team, and you're doing that without a bunch of really critical players. I mean, go take the Chicago Bears and subtract Kareem Mack for the entire season as their best edge player, right? Go go subtract a bunch of other good players. Subtract, uh, you know, their linebacking for the the player out of uh, I can't think of his name, player out of Georgia um, that they drafted at, at inside backer. Uh, oh, Roquan Smith. Yeah, Roquan Smith. Yeah. Okay, so kind of the same principle, right? Subtract a really good linebacker, subtract yeah. their best edge player, and all of a sudden, what do they look like? Well, defensively, they're not going to be nearly as good. Now, yeah. I also don't know if the Vikings have an interior D lineman like Akeem Hicks. Like, I don't know no. if they have a player of that talent or that production or disruption. But again, you, you just factor that all in and you say, man, it would be a completely different season for that football team if those people weren't playing defensively. And there's no doubt it would. I mean, it's just the way that the NFL works. It's the way all football works, right? It's about personnel. It's why college recruiting is such a big deal because it's who, what people you have in your roster. Alabama always has really good players. Clemson keeps getting really good players. It's why they keep showing up. Ohio State has really good players. And it's also why the NFL drafts from those, those schools, right? Because they're really good players. And the NFL teams that draft the best and their guys stay healthy and have a bit of luck because luck is a factor in this. You don't get hurt your whole career. Your career may go pretty long in the NFL. But there are guys who get hurt in their first season and they never pan out, even though potential wise, they were very, very highly touted and could have been very good. And every team has that, right? The guy who doesn't work out. And I mean, you just look at a guy who comes into camp as a rookie. Jefferson at wide receiver for the Vikings is a great example. How does his career play out if instead of in year one, he's a 1,400-yard superstar breakout receiver versus he tears his ACL in preseason camp, right? His whole career might have changed. He might have never amounted to anything for them. But instead, he's on the trajectory where it looks like he's going to be you know, a star player in the league for years to come. Those things happen all the time, right? These really great players come to the league and don't pan out because you know all kinds of stuff happens. Um, and so I think I think it would have drastically changed. The Vikings and they were very close to being a playoff team. But again, that's a drastically different question too than are they Super Bowl contender with what they've got? That's a whole different deal. That's that's totally fair. That's totally fair. Sam, do you have anything here within second down you think for Brian? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking like and, and for me, uh I'm not as as diehard. I've kind of said Kyle's the, the diehard Vikings fan and I'm just a, a diehard NFL fan. And so for me, I think I've seen the way that a lot of franchises um, can lack a little bit of hope in terms of what they are are experiencing. And and so my question to you, and you may not have anything in that, that may not help with the hope, but is there anything that you saw from watching the Vikings defense or as you evaluate this Vikings defense that fans can be like hopeful for as they kind of think about next season and beyond? Well, for sure. I mean, I think... Number one, if you look at who they were a year ago in 2019, they're the seventh ranked team in DVOA, which is the fancy metric for saying how good are you defensively against everybody else if you normalize for who you played and all that kind of thing. They were seventh ranked team. They're a top 10 defense. You put all their pieces back, you reload the gun and actually go into it with the whole thing. They're probably a top 10 defense again. And offensively, they look better, in my opinion, than they have in a long time. They have two really good running backs that fit their scheme. Um, and especially at the price point that they're both at is where they fit a first string running back, second string running back structure. They have a nice wide zone scheme that sets up everything else. I think Kirk Cousins can operate that offense pretty effectively. And other guys who have similar skill sets to him are having success in other s- schemes around the league. They have a number one wide receiver now uh, that is really, really young and explosive. Thielen is still a really good player. They have a couple of nice tight ends. And I think Irv Smith is going to be a really good player as he develops because I think he's, you know, he's not fully grown into who he can be. They got some nice pieces there. I think they can be better than they've been over the last couple of years if they're back with everything back intact. So there's hope there. There's also hope in that you see a football team that had nothing to play for in the last week of the season and still played super hard. That means they're bought into what they're doing organizationally, they're not going, well, screw it, we'll just play for a draft pick. And uh, we all know how mad Philadelphia fans are right now for that type of mentality. The Minnesota Vikings would have been better off losing the last game of the year. They chose not to. And I also think if you look at how they improved defensively, I mean, they started off with, what, 
Packers playoff team, Colts playoff team, Titans playoff team, Texans with a great quarterback, not a very good team this year, but certainly, you know, create some challenges and Seahawks playoff team. Four out of the first five. And they didn't do, they didn't fare well, right? They're a, they're a one and four team after five games. It's not looking very good. They lose to the Falcons in week six, which was a obviously not a good loss. And then they go on to the bye week. That team could have folded, but they did not. They got better defensively in terms of a lot of the critical air mistakes where you're just hurting yourself. Those don't show up nearly as much in the second half of the season. Physical beats where the guy got beat by the guy across from him, those show up in the second half of the season. But I think mentally they were playing hard and trying to do the right thing. Now, losing physically, that's a personnel problem, not an effort issue. So you say, well, man, the effort was pretty dang good the second half of the season. Well, that's a testament to guys who believe in Mike Zimmer, who believe in the coaching staff, who believe in what they're doing, and then play really hard. And that's always been the Vikings' M.O. on defense. They play really, really hard, passionate, hard, physical football. And now if they can put the personnel that matches that, now all of a sudden you got something shaking because confidence without personnel is just confidence. That's, you know, it's, it doesn't play itself out into wins. But if they can just find a way to get the people back, keep people healthy, and add some talent, they're in good shape. They'll be fine. Now, again, are they a Super Bowl team? That's a huge question mark because that, be- that begins to get into questions of how good do you think your quarterback is? How good do you think your team is? And, you know, are the Vikings Super Bowl caliber? It's, I think it's possible for them if they improve, but I don't think they're there right now, um, even if they have all their pieces back. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was one of the comments we kind of made, even as they were in that last playoff push, as there was a little bit of glimmer of hope for the last few games. I, I said to Kyle, I said, like, there, there's a chance they could get in, but should they get in or like, do we really want to see this team in the playoffs? And obviously you want to see your team succeed and you want them to be there, but there definitely need to be uh, some upgrades. And we, we're hopeful that, that as next season comes and as you get back some guys from injury, that that, that will happen. Um, so, yeah, just transitioning from that into the third down, re, I think keeping on this conversation, what do you see uh, that Mike Zimmer could do to get the most out of this Vikings defense uh, that, that, we, uh, that we're working with right now? Well, I think they're going to have a decision to make about what they do next. Is this a deal where they try to go find the right edge pass rushers, and certainly they're going to get one back from injury in principle. You know, Hunter's going to come back, and they're going to have one really good guy coming back into the mix. It was really interesting. I thought they got a really good one in uh, – <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you know, they, they go out and get Yannick from Jacksonville. Um, he leads them in sacks on the season. I think he played six games for those guys, and, and he was still their, their sack leader. Um, so you, you certainly are curious, like, what happened there? Why is he now in Baltimore? And, you know, how did that all play itself out? Because he seemed like a good fit for them. Uh, he's the right kind of guy. He can manufacture his own edge pass rush. He's a good edge player. Um, so it's really interesting that they went away from him, moved away from him. Um, but it is curious that maybe that is a sign of looking for certain other qualities on the edges. Um, if you look at what a lot of teams are doing now, they're doing a lot more hybridized stuff where there's guys who can kind of play between a role where they're an edge player that can also do some coverage things. I mean, I don't know if the Vikings are going to be interested in getting into some of the simulated pressures that other teams are using, but like Atlanta is a good example. They're a four down team who is now dropping one of those DNs out a little bit more, right? Using him as a, a hybridized edge player so they can bring a linebacker as the fourth rusher and drop and still play their, you know, drop seven principles. I mean, is that something that they look to get into? They're also just going to have to address the fact that they have two really good safeties who do all the veteran things that you could ever hope for. They disguise really well. They get people lined up. They make lots of plays. Those two guys aren't getting any young, and they both cost about $11 million a year. At some point, they're going to have young safeties. So how are they going to transition to that particular portion of the, the pain that is NFL where you've had guys that you really depend on that know your scheme really well, and sooner or later they either retire where they become unaffordable because of the cap or whatever the situation is, you know, they're going to have to address that part of it too. And does that change what they want to do going forward? But obviously the biggest piece of this is getting the pass rushers up front back that fit what they want, which is, you know, being able to stop the run on first down, get into obvious pass rush situations and win with a four man pass rush. That's who they see themselves as. And that's who they've been for a long time. Will that adjust over time? I mean, we've even seen Seattle, who's always lived in kind of that world, 
they've transitioned, right? They're doing a lot more odd front stuff. They've changed up. They're doing different things defensively. I imagine that they will be evaluating all of that as a possibility of what they're going to do going forward because with the salary that they have at quarterback, they're going to have to really think through what is the price point of some of these people because the reality is they're not going to be able to just go pay a really elite edge pass rusher a huge contract with the rest of the salary cap being what it is for them. So I would imagine, and there's a lot of other people who are a lot bigger experts on the salary cap. I'm not by any stretch, but I do know when your quarterback costs that much money, it affects the rest of the roster. You can't just go buy whatever the heck you want. And so what's that going to look like? And I think that might mean some hybridization up front and some of those kinds of things for them in the future, because it's just the nature of what's going to happen. Also, you're at the mercy of what college is producing. College produces who they produce. And then the NFL picks from those people. So if the college level has got a bunch of hybridized players, you better start thinking about this is what's available. And this guy that I want, that's this four down edge pass rusher, traditional if he's not existing anymore or he's becoming harder to find in terms of quantity, his price goes up, right? It's like all economic principles. Supply goes down, price goes up. So how are we going to find that guy? And if that guy doesn't exist, then we're going to have to tailor our defense to fit what is available in the draft. And because of all the RPOs, because of all the other stuff in college, you just don't see many true edge rush four down defenses anymore across the college landscape. So how are they going to find their guy? And this has happened to a lot of offenses in the NFL, too. They've started to adjust to colleges producing who they produce, their schemed how they're schemed. We have to then start to adjust and change a little bit to what those guys are doing because that's who they're sending on to the next level. And I think the Vikings will probably have to continue to evolve and adjust in that area. Right. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, at the end of the day, you're getting – you've essentially got one method of – getting players, right? And that's from, I mean, the NFL as a whole, I mean, I know the teams can dip into free agency, but in terms of the NFL as a league, they get their players from college. And so what college has is what the NFL gets, right? And so that makes total sense. And so then maybe one of the questions I have for you then is, you know, so I know with fans, I think myself personally, a lot of fans, I mean, uh, we're hopeful for someone like DJ Wanham, who's a fourth round defensive end, uh, I think he had like two and a half sacks in the year. He's long, you know, he moves really, really well. Uh, I think he's raw. And so, I mean, when you make that jump from college to the NFL, you know, how difficult is that jump, say, especially in the middle of a pandemic where you don't have training camp and OTAs, et cetera, et cetera. And how much could we really expect then maybe, you know, what DJ Wanham is being asked to do as a college player, you know, it's probably going to be a fair amount different than what's going on in the NFL. Maybe not. Maybe it is. How much can we expect someone like him to grow? You know, with the full off season, Andre Patterson, Zimmer working with him, you know, is it conceivable that this is someone who could really make a big jump and some of that growth, some of that production, the sack production, the pressure, some of that hopefully can come internally. Can we be hopeful for someone like Warren? What are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. These guys make huge jumps because what they did in college a lot of times doesn't translate to the NFL for several reasons, one of which is you can get away with some stuff in college that you can't do in the pros. You might beat a guy with just pure athleticism, but when you get to the NFL, the guy across from you is really talented, really well coached, and he may have veteran experience on you because he's been in the league six seasons and you've been in the league six minutes. So it's a very different world, right, for those guys. And they have to learn how to operate in that situation. And so in college, you also get some matchups that are just tremendously favorable for you because the guy across from you might be a sophomore and you're a senior. And the reality is that he he is an NFL level draft pick at some point, but he isn't right now. And so you're going against a guy that you're just tremendously better than and you can beat him in those situations. That doesn't exist as much in the NFL because everybody's really talented. So it will come down to, does he develop? Does he understand what he needs to do to take those leaps? And you see guys that just some guys blossom in those situations and some guys don't like a guy that's really fascinating. Uh, Shelby Harris, he plays D tackle for Denver. He's a guy who played at Northern Illinois, obviously not a power five school. It's a group of five school in the Mac doesn't have nearly as much of the blue blood credibility as playing in the SEC or something like that. And then he's become a really dynamic, dominant pass rusher in the NFL because he's developed. Well, what has happened there? I mean, there's just a lot of factors. Part of it is he, he grew into his body and found a role. He got a particular 
a set of skills that then got developed by guys that coached him in the NFL. He put in a ton of hard work and he stayed healthy. That's the other factor. He didn't have any of those catastrophic injuries, setbacks, sorts of things. And he certainly didn't come in during the pandemic either, right? So that certainly set back a lot of these guys who were coming in as rookies this year. And I think if you just look across the board, the guy that you're evaluating in your draft class, you don't, you don't evaluate it after his first year. You evaluate him after his third year. If he's gone through three years in your structure in the same team without coaching changes, without all that kind of turmoil, what does he look like in year three? I think he will look like a drastically different player in year three. And usually year three players look like one of two things. They become really good or they've gotten cut. That's it. That's all there really is in the NFL at that point in their career. Uh, you know, they're, you know, free agent type guys at that point or something. Um, so I think he'll improve. I think he'll become a better edge pass rusher. And obviously they think that too. I don't think Ngakwe gets traded out of there if they don't think they have some pieces on the roster that they feel really good could be good players for them in the future. Because I just don't think you trade away a really good asset unless you think you've got some stuff in the pipeline that you feel comfortable with because their career is resting on it. They don't just make those on a whim and go, oh, well, let me get rid of this really good player. And you know, we'll hope for the best with these other guys. I mean, obviously they have some confidence that they've got some good things in the works. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I can remember Andre Patterson after the Ngakwe trade. And I think most people, fans or writers or whoever, took that as a signal of the Vikings basically embracing the tank, which was not what happened. They came out of the bye and played super competitive football and played really well. Um, you know, and, and going into week 15, they controlled their playoff destiny. If they just won out, they would have been in, right? And so it was kind of astonishing that they got to that point. And so trading in Gakwe definitely, we can say, I think pretty definitively, was not about tanking because that's not what they went out and tried to do. But I can remember Andre Patterson just saying, it just didn't seem like a good fit. And so I, I don't know if that means he didn't do as good a job with run defense, perhaps. I mean, he certainly he certainly shows up uh, in some of these big splash plays. Um, but I think what you're saying is making sense. You don't move on from a player of that caliber. I mean, and Gakwe's 25, and Duke can rush the passer. You don't just give away a 25-year-old pass rusher, right? Like, that's an extremely valuable player for your team. And so, fair enough. I mean, maybe that says uh, certainly a fair bit about somebody like DJ Wanham. It's a good point. I wanted to ask you about, I mean, you had mentioned a few minutes ago Harrison Smith and uh, Anthony Harris. You mentioned the two elite safeties. How, how difficult was it for those two guys this year? I'm sure it was really hard. I mean, Harrison Smith is a magician. Like, if you yeah. want to watch – a guy who's really good at disguising coverage and, and doing veteran things that you just watch him and you think, wow, that is a really high level football play. I don't think he gets mentioned enough in the category of really elite safeties in the NFL um, for any number of reasons. But you watch him play and you see a lot of similarities where the comparison to Tyron Matthews is very applicable. Here's this like super versatile guy who really understands the intricacy of the game. He's disguising all kinds of stuff. He's driving the car when it comes to you know, you just think in, in general, if you just bottom line, boil it down really, really simplistically, you have your two high coverages and you have your one high coverages and then you have your no high coverages, right? And the Vikings run all three. And so you'll have situations where, you know, Harrison Smith is disguising down near the line of scrimmage. It looks like it's clearly going to be one high or no high. He's going to pressure. He's going to do all these different things. All of a sudden the cadence starts. He opens his hips and starts bailing and his hips are open outside. His eye discipline is outside. He's very nuanced and deliberate in what he's doing body position wise. Quarterback's looking at that saying, that guy's a deep half play. He's clearly going to split safety be here. And that's what I'm getting. All of a sudden his hips snap on the, on the snap. He snaps his hips back, rolls to the post. And all of a sudden the coverage is rotated to a different place. And you say, well, how did they, how did they run right at an eight man front at the unblocked player? Well, it started off like Harrison Smith was down and he was going to be the unblocked player. And all of a sudden, they rolled the coverage the other way, and the other safety's in the box, and he's the unblocked player. And at no point did you think that's what was happening throughout the whole progression. And you're like, wow, that's a really impressive football play on a very subtle, nuanced level, where that guy being able to disguise that way is a big part of what made this work. And there's a reason those guys, the two safeties, both get paid over $11 million. They didn't get that just because of, you know, oh, you're a veteran, so we're going to give you this money. They do something that other people cannot do. So those are the kind of things that they bring to the table. 
And when you play in the secondary, it's always frustrating when you're not getting to the quarterback as often as you would like because you're back there trying to cover and you're on the island. And here's the truism. If I'm out in coverage, everybody can see my number and know who I am. I give up a completion and everybody in the stadium knows I'm, you know, they're out there calling me a bum, right? There's an interior pass rusher who they may never even notice that he didn't get a pass rush the whole game. I'm on an island. He's not in terms of the spotlight that shines on me. And so, yeah, does it get frustrating? Of course it does. But I think most players are realistic. I assume that he probably went through the whole season thinking that all of his teammates were trying really hard and, you know, trying real hard doesn't get it done all the time. And so it's a different deal when you think that, you know, that guy's not trying or something like that. I watch the Vikings. I see guys trying really hard. Doesn't always work out well. So I'm sure that, you know, it gives you some peace of mind where it's like, yeah, the teammates I have are trying really hard, playing really hard and bought into what we're doing. We just aren't necessarily making all the plays we want to make. And it's putting a lot of stress on us. I think those two safeties had to make up for two young corners that they were trying to protect. Being in a too high defense helps you in coverage, right? You have more versatility where safeties can help corners in coverage, but there are run difficulties there, right? It's a seven man front. You don't have that extra guy. So now you've got to fit the run with the seven in the box. Guys have to come off blocks. Guys have to make plays or certain things that have to happen. And that put a lot of stress on those guys as well that, you know, you're not stopping the run as well as you wanted to. Um, and in the past game, you're trying to protect those corners some amount. And so that all results in, oh man, like there's a lot happening for the secondary to make up for things that are happening in the front end. And, you know, you're trying to cover up those deficiencies. And, and sometimes it asks guys to go do things that are really difficult too. It's like, oh man, the guy, the thing that guy had to go do was really, really difficult because we were trying to cover up for this other deficiency we have in our, in our personnel or an area of stress within our defense. And so we're asking a guy to go make a play that's really, really difficult. How many of those is he going to make? And when he doesn't make it, again, what does the crowd say? He's a bum. Well, how difficult was that play? You know, it's a nine on out of 10, right? As a coach, I'm looking at it going, wow, that is a really difficult play to make. And he made it or he didn't make it. Well, I mean, the reality is if you ask a guy to try to make as a bunch of eight, nine, 10 level plays on a scale of one to 10, he's only going to make some percentage of those because the guy he's going against is good. And the thing he was asked to do is really difficult. So I think they got asked to do some really hard stuff this year, and they still play. And I think that's a sign of being veteran players who are good. That's what they do. Um, that's also a sign of a good good football team, right? They they leaned on good players in their roster. They said, oh, these other good players are out. Who are we going to lean on? The good players we got left. Let's let's make them have to carry the biggest burden in this deal. And they did, and that that's hard on those guys, though. Right. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. And I mean, you uh, you mentioned. Um, the Vikings fans know, I mean, Smith, he's older now. Anthony Harris is probably going to be gone. He was on the franchise tag. I don't imagine he'll be back. I just don't think they'll have the money to make it work. Uh, and so one thing, you know, one of Zimmer's philosophies is that I'm going to get the best five offensive linemen out there, and I don't care about shots them around. So Ezra Cleveland, who played left tackle at Boise State, was playing right guard by the end because Zimmer thought that these were our best five offensive linemen, so it doesn't matter if he needs to change his footwork or whatever. We're getting Cleveland out there. And so my point is, how difficult would it be then? He, he seems reluctant to do that in the secondary. Is it? Would it be difficult, say, for a young corner, for a Harrison Hand, for a Chris Boyd, some of these guys who really are physical and tackle well, good explosiveness, sometimes a step behind in coverage? You know, how realistic is it to say that we could plug in one of these young corners into safety? You see it sometimes. I'm thinking of. Uh, um, I think it was Charles Woodson. You see some of these like older corners transition to safety in their career. Could you expect that with these young guys, or is that just totally unrealistic? First thing, Charles Woodson's one of the best players in NFL history in the secondary. That's true. So, and, and there is no doubt a guy like him can do a bunch of things, and he, he could have played safety his whole career because he was a very unique, special talent. Um, could could some of these corners potentially transition? Yeah, but I do think it is a different world. I mean, what a corner does, the coverage techniques that they utilize, uh, a lot of it is one-on-one coverage, covering an outside receiver, covering a guy in the slot. So whether you're talking about a, a nickel, who's essentially a slot corner, or you're talking about your outside guys, they do what they do, and they don't necessarily get involved in the run game in the same way. They don't get involved in the pressure in the same way. I mean, if you go look and diagnose the two safeties, being a post-safety is a totally different animal than being a 
uh, you know, man to man cover or a flat defending corner, right? I mean, they, they operate in different skill sets with totally different principles. So I think that that's a big ask and it is really, really challenging. I do think sometimes though, you have to, again, where does your talent come from? So you make the offensive line uh, situation. You might have a guy who the best O lineman in college is asked to play left tackle on his college team. And then he's asked to move to guard in the NFL because the reality is he's no longer the best offensive lineman on the roster on his now NFL team, but he was the best offensive lineman in college. So he played left tackle because they needed him at that position. You might have a guy that, Hey, you played tackle in college, but you can snap. So we will start training you to be a center because that's very valuable to us in the NFL. Cause they're, like you said, they're playing the best available. There are certainly some corners who maybe have that ability to, to transition. But I think a lot of times you're looking for a safety who has the safety skill set that you want. And I don't think there are very few corners who do what those two guys do for the Vikings, right? Like, you know, Harrison Smith and Harris, I mean, they, they do certain things that are just their safety things. They don't have the same skill set. Now, you might be able to find a guy that can do some nickel dime hybridized stuff for you because Tyron Matthews kind of taken on that role. Some other guys in the league have taken on that. Is he a safety or is he a safety nickel hybrid? I think they might find some of those guys. Um, they might have guys on their roster that can become that player, uh, but truly playing safety every down, snap in and snap out. I'm not sure if, if you know, that's, that all comes down to who's on their roster and what do they think about those individual people. And then some of it's football IQ stuff. You might have a smart corner who his smarts are not X's and O's, get up on the whiteboard and explain it to everybody quarterback of the defense type of smarts. His smarts are, I'm really good at studying people. I'm really good at studying body language and demeanor. And this is really cooling me into what route this guy might run. And I'm combining that with my physical tools to go be a great player. You compare that to a guy who might play safety where his smarts might be, I'm really good at getting us in the right check, the right coverage call, all that kind of stuff all the time. I'm really good at pre-snap identifications and things like that. If you ever watch any of the NFL film stuff about Richard Sherman, He's a high IQ guy, like high IQ just as a human, right? And then he's a high football IQ guy, and he used that to his advantage because physically there were times where he was outmatched physically in the matchups. So if you've got it, and then the 49ers used him as a safety this year because that skill set tends to translate well. He's a quarterback of the defense, make calls for the back end kind of dude because he's really smart. I mean, he went to Stanford. I mean, it's, he's a smart dude period, the end, right, by any measure of football or otherwise. And so if you have a guy like that, he might fit. But you have some corners who are not great at the communication and processing portion, so they're not great at making calls for you. Well, he does he transition mentally for you? Well, I don't know. It depends on the guy, right? That's, that's 100% that individual. And they probably didn't evaluate those corners in necessarily that way because they were like, well, our corners don't necessarily make these calls so he's not necessarily a real vocal guy who makes a lot of those kind of calls but he's really good at knowing his job he's really good at you know understanding what receivers do and and those types of football IQ things because IQ is a big spectrum of stuff what are the skills that you have so is it possible yeah it's possible but I would imagine it's probably going to come from drafting a guy who played college safety from a good program with a pick that's probably in the you know upper half of the draft like you're not finding a lot of elite safeties in the seventh round. Like it's just not there anymore. Safeties have taken on a different value set where, you know, are they getting drafted in the fir- third, fourth, fifth? For sure. Right. Are they getting drafted late in the draft? Maybe. Right. But there's not a ton of those anymore. Like the NFL is pretty darn good at evaluating talent at this point. So they, they do a pretty good job of finding those guys. Fair enough. Yeah, that's fair enough. Sam, what do you think? I got a couple questions locked and loaded with Sam. Do you want to hit Brian with one? One or two? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Why don't Why don't you go? Because the question I have is is uh, on a on a different tangent. The the only question I've got. Okay. Well, maybe to keep in the secondary. And again, this is one uh, one of the things that I just think is insanity is folks who are maybe down on Jeff Gladney and his season, uh, which I just think is wild. Because uh, I, I I I'm really encouraged by how he played. You know how how difficult was it for Jeff Gladney? You know, Zim talked about how he was playing both outside and inside. And Zim basically defined that as two separate positions in a sense. How difficult is it for someone not just to make the jump as a rookie to being a starting NFL corner, but to playing both outside and inside? Uh, can you maybe just talk a little bit about how difficult that was for Gladney? Oh, I mean, it's insane. 
I mean, there's a lot of veteran players who are never asked to do something that difficult. Because just think about for a, pers- for a second. You're a rookie in the NFL. You're trying to learn a new scheme. You're learning all new terminology because one of the things that's brutal about football is that we live in a, uh, a Tower of Babel sort of scenario. Everybody speaks a different language. Everybody calls it something else. So you don't have the same terminology at Alabama as, as at Clemson. And that terminology doesn't necessarily match up with any NFL franchise. And it certainly doesn't match up 100%. You might have a few terms that have they've taken on a place within the football lexicon where they're pretty common, but there's not universal terminology at all. So everybody's speaking a different language. He doesn't get any OTAs. He doesn't get any freshman rookie minicamp stuff where he's, because when rookie minicamp happens, the rookies are the only guys there. So they get all the attention of the coaches. There is no, well, there's a, a veteran in front of you and, you know, they already know stuff. So we're going to go really fast. You can slow it down. You can walk those guys along and help them learn. And a lot of it's very much the walk through mental repetition stuff that gets you ready for when practice starts. You're hopefully not way behind the veterans. You at least know what the words mean and have an idea what you're supposed to do. And then you're trying to see if you can actually physically go do it. So he lost out on all that stuff. And so he's trying to learn that. And he's trying to learn it for two completely different positions. Because remember, when you play in the slot, you might have zone drop element stuff that you've got to do. You've got to learn those zone drops. And a guy who's playing a curl flat or a hook curl or a seam technique, those are completely different than playing a deep third, playing in the, in the uh, you know deep, uh, deep zone or something like that, or playing in the flat as a cover two corner. And then obviously you've got man-to-man technique. And you say, well, they play man-to-man technique on a slot and they play man-to-man technique on an outside receiver. Those are the same things. There's got to be some carryover. Well, certainly there's some overlap. But remember, there's completely different route trees that happen at the X receiver isolated on the backside of three by one and in a slot in a, in a you know, two by two or in a interior receiver in a three by one. Plus, you've got to know the scouting report on every single receiver who populates those positions. Right. So I got to know the scouting report on all the slot receiver now that play in that space that normally is just what a nickel has to know. And I have to know outside receivers for regular down and distance and other times when I'm playing on the outside. So I'm not only learning a whole bunch of physical stuff that I have to do that's different at the two positions. So the actual techniques, footwork, and, and the way that I have to move. I also have to learn all these routes and I have to defend a bunch of different kinds of stuff. And I also have to do that against the best players in the world. I mean, that ask is huge. The fact that it, there's a reason most people don't get asked to do that. It's very, very difficult. So will he improve when he's not asked to do that? Probably. Will he improve when he has more experience? Yes. Cause that, what he's being asked to do is insanely difficult. And I think that's sometimes where fans don't necessarily always appreciate how hard what was being asked to do. Not to mention the fact that you have to understand the NFL route trees and quarterbacks are just totally different animals. Because if you think about a college quarterback, everyone will gush over Trevor Lawrence, for example. He's a fine quarterback. Trevor Lawrence's skill set is very similar to a lot of guys in the NFL already. Right. There's a lot of guys in the NFL who can make a lot of the throws that he makes. Right. And so there will be guys who will criticize the quarterback. Kirk Cousins catches criticism. Kirk Cousins can make a lot of throws that most quarterbacks on the planet cannot make. So here's the thing. He lines up against you. And in college, you got away with, I can trail this guy by half a step and he ain't getting that outcut in there. And some NFL quarterback just in practice, who's the third string quarterback on your roster, burns in that outcut. Oh. This is a whole different world because what covered means in the NFL and what covered in college are, are two different things. Those dudes throw the ball into windows where the guy is in principle covered, but they throw him uncovered by throwing it on a line in the right place where it's supposed to go. And so I think all that stuff makes it really, really difficult. So again, where do you evaluate him? You evaluate him three years down the line. If he's this same player in three years, yeah, it's a fail. There's no doubt. Because if he's the same guy in year three that he was in year one or something similar, yeah, you're disappointed. But if he's what he is now, plus two years of experience and significantly improved, heck, he could be, you know, a pro bowl level player. I mean, that's the reality of how the NFL works. And there's plenty of guys who've fallen on that trajectory. Their rookie season was a challenge. They made some plays. They didn't make some plays. And then two years, two more years in, all of a sudden, they're a guy going, well, not only are we going to have to extend him past his rookie deal, we're going to have to pay this dude. And that's obviously a whole other set of, of deal. But that's what that's where the Vikings want to be. They want young defensive players that are on young, cheaper contracts. Because when you have a quarterback who gets paid a ton of money, you're better figure out how you're going to pay those other dudes. And a lot of that is going to be because they have young guys playing on defense who are not being paid huge contracts. Right, right. Well, maybe I'll ask you 
one final question before I hand you over to Sam. And he's going to hit you with the real of the heavy hitters. But the final question I have for you then, so you're a defensive coordinator. So I kind of want to get into your mind a little bit. And I'm I'm thinking of, I'm sure you watched this um, this game, which was a tough one to watch, but I'm sure you watched the Christmas Day game, Saints and Vikings. It was ugly, right? Like, it was just, it was really ugly. Uh, so you're a defensive coordinator on the sidelines, and you see your defense struggling like that. What do you do? How do you respond? Well, you hope that you had a second plan and a third plan in terms of practice and preparation that you feel good about. And you go out and you try to get your guys into the mindset of, we're flipping the script and going to that second plan, third plan types of stuff. But the reality is that sometimes you don't have a great day. Like you, you don't play well. Things have gone badly. And so then you have some decisions to make as a coach about how do you want to approach this going forward? Do you want to just throw everything out and try and, you know, run some stuff that you haven't repped a ton or that is really kind of in the fringe of your playbook and try to keep yourself in the game? Or do you stick with the things that you know you've practiced the most and say, hey, guys, we have to get better running what we do. We have to buy into this. And then when we get into the film room, we're going to look at what went right, what went wrong, and then try to build on the loss as opposed to try and throw away all that hard work you did by saying, hey, the second things get tough, our defense goes out the window. We stop trusting the scheme. We stop trusting the principles. And most NFL coaches are not going to throw away what they are because Mike Zimmer has been doing it for decades. It's not like this is a new structure and all of a sudden the Vikings defensive scheme is unproven. It's very well proven. Not only is it proven in Minnesota, it's been proven at other stops by him and guys who have coached with him and for him at other stops. This is tried and true NFL defense. So I don't think they throw it all out. You hope that you can execute a little bit better and make adjustments, but sometimes things just go bad. And when they go bad, sometimes they go really bad. And obviously that, that happened for them. Um, but I also think you have to understand that when a game is going sideways. You sometimes the game gets to a point where it's so out of control that ultimately losing it big and badly isn't as heartbreaking as losing a close game on the last play or a last second field goal or a last second touchdown. It was like we played like absolute, you know, crap today and we got run off the field by those guys and we're going to come back next week and come back and recharge and restart. And ultimately, putting this game behind us isn't going to be that bad because we played so bad that there's really nothing redeemable about what just happened right there. And I do think that's a testament to the guys on their roster and their coaches and everybody is that that stretch at the end of the season happened where the playoffs became not a factor anymore, right? They were in the playoff mix. They got out of the playoff mix because of those losses. And then the next thing happened, which was they played really hard in the last game of the season, a game that doesn't matter. Right. That says something about who they are and what they think. Um, and that's a good sign. I think that's a positive note from that. But the reality is sometimes it goes really bad and you hope your second plan and third plan work. Um, but you also you know, when you play some of these really good offensive coaches, sometimes their plan is better than your plan and their execution was better than your. And that Alvin Kamara guy is pretty good. He's a pretty good football player. Yeah, he uh, he's pretty excellent. And that was a game where. I just kept thinking, man, oh man, do we miss Eric Hendricks? Not that, not that it's a per, I mean, Kamara would still get the best of him some reps, but that's a matchup where I say, okay, I'll see your Kamara and I'll give you my Hendricks and we're going to go at it. And, uh, so we, we definitely missed him there. But Sam, what do you, what do you? And, and to add to that, yeah. when you think about defense in general, defenses never want the game to turn into one man, one tackle. You never want it to be one defender versus the ball carrier because like you said, the ball carriers, especially in the NFL, will win some percentage of those matchups. Yeah. Where the Vikings really struggled in the run game in that in that particular matchup was that there was a bunch of plays that did come down to one man, one tackle, and Kamara yes. was the better man on the play. And so what you're hoping there is that a bunch of those times, other defenders are able to disengage from blocks because you can't get unblocked people all the time. That's not a thing. It's certainly not a thing in the NFL. So how can you get more guys off blocks and more hats to football where it's not one-on-one, it's two-on-one, three-on-one, four-on-one pursuit to the football, and that's where they really struggled. They really had a hard time. And 
the Saints are obviously a very good playoff team who's going to have a chance at winning a Super Bowl. I mean, they're a legitimate Super Bowl contender in this season. And you look at that and you say, okay, that's kind of where we are. We're at a place where their one-on-ones ended up, they won a lot of those one-on-ones, and we didn't end up in getting into those situations where we're two-on-one, three-on-one at the tackle. And Alvin Kamara in one-on-one is a tough ask of anybody. Even the best players in the league have struggled with the dude because he's pretty elite. Um, and so I think that's an area where I'm sure they looked at that and said, look at how many times we didn't end up off a block. Look at how many times we ended up attached at the end of this play. And that dude's running full speed on our secondary. And I don't care how good your DBs are. If Alvin Kamara is running full speed on you, not deviate and course into the back end, uh, it's going to be a long day in the back end making tackles on that cat. And so now it's a, not only a long run, now it's an explosive run. And those are really devastating because you know, that's how you get run out of the, run out of the stadium. It's an explosive place turn into scores very quickly. And that's exactly what happens. So fair enough. I, and I, I appreciate you explaining that. Um, fair enough. Totally fair. What do you got, Sam? Yeah, no, this is great. And I think this is, I, I feel obviously we've seen there's, it's been a tough year at times to watch this team and watch this defense. Um, but I think just from this conversation, I feel at least from my perspective, I feel a little bit hopeful. I think that you've pointed out some some real good things about uh, what this team has and and things that I think sometimes you can get a little bit jaded as a as a fan and see only the mistakes. And so, um, yeah, I think that this is this is great. I know you're a defensive guy, and so I I I think for the Vikings now, besides the draft, I think the the uh, offensive rookie of the year is kind of. The, the closest thing that we're looking forward to in terms of um, some success, I guess. And so I know you're, you're on a Vikings podcast, and so you may not feel like you can say exactly your opinion, but, but Jefferson and, and, uh, and Herbert, do you have any, any thoughts on, on that debate? I think that quarterback is so significantly different that it oftentimes is just not comparable because of what a QB is asked to do. And so Jefferson may lose just on the nature of everyone knows that quarterback is a very difficult thing to, because for example, if you run a post in college, it's probably pretty similar to the post that you ran in the NFL. That's a reality. You get more carryover, although the coverages are significantly more complex and the, the competition, and that doesn't diminish in my mind anything that he did. He's a great player. I just think that all the mental stuff that Herbert had to do to be a quarterback and be successful is pretty impressive, but I do think you can't discount the fact that he didn't just at wide receiver. He didn't just perform well for a rookie. Like he performed well for a wide receiver period. Like that's end of phrase. Herbert performed well for a rookie. In my opinion, I don't think he performed at the same level that you would say of the guys who were playing at the highest level of quarterback in the league, because that's Pat Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers and those guys. So there's part of me that says, Hey, from a truly performed at the highest level of his position, you probably do favor the wide receiver, right? You probably do favor a guy who just I mean, knocked it out. That's the bottom line. You can't 1,400 yards and that that type of – and it's not just the yardage. It's the way he did it, the ability to get open, the way he ran routes, the stress and strain that he placed on people. Um, and I think that, that I mean, he deserves a ton of credit for what he did. I ultimately think other people – and I probably would fall into this trap too. Quarterback is such an important position that it's so difficult. You give the correct, you, if it's, if you think it's close or you think it's even, you give it to the quarterback. It's what happens in the Heisman Trophy every year. Because the bottom line is, if you think the quarterback's close, you're like, eh, we're giving it to the quarterback. Cause let's face it, it's really hard. So I think Herbert probably gets the edge just because of that. But, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody should discount what he's done. I mean, Jefferson has had an unbelievable season and he's a huge factor now. The question for him is the question every rookie runs into. When they game plan for you, as you go forward in your career, and you are the focal point, what does his productivity look like? Because the bottom line is, you know, Devontae Adams in Green Bay, people game plan for him. Can't nobody stop him, right? He keeps getting open. He keeps finding a way to catch passes. Um, Hopkins down in, uh, in Arizona, the dude got open in Houston. He gets open in Arizona. It's really difficult to stop those guys. And that's, they're the upper tier. So for Jefferson, his next question mark, whether he wins rookie of the year or not, will be how does he adjust as they continue to account for him in the game plan? Because they will. And there's no doubt 
Thielen takes some of that stress off of him because you do need to account for Thielen. If you don't, he's going to hurt you too. And he's proven that he still can do that. And their run game is definitely a factor because if you decide you're going to do nothing but play brackets and two high coverages to take him away, uh, Dalvin Cook's going to run down your face. And and their backup the, is Matt Matheson. Or who's yeah, Alexander Madison. Yeah, yeah, he's Madison. I mean, he's a very good wide zone back too. So if you decide, oh, he's now in the game, we're now going to play some more brackets. You might still get punished with that stuff too. So it's not like you're solved automatically. And then I think Herb Smith, if he can continue to grow and be closer to what he was in college. They really have a nice way to stress you because as you play those brackets and you play those two highs, you now have a tight end who's going to get matched up against a linebacker, a safety, potentially a dime. But if you put dime in, they're probably going to run the ball on you. But if you play nickel and match him up with a linebacker, I think Irv Smith's a bad matchup for a lot of linebackers. So now you've got a situation where you might be able to attack the middle of the field and it'll be interesting to see what he creates for other people as they have to account for him too. That'll also be a very fascinating deal. Um, but I, I would say, unfortunately for Vikings fans, Herbert probably gets the nod just because he's a QB. And that's the, the quarterback bias that exists everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's for sure, right? The, they both had record, record setting years and, and it's unfortunate that I guess awards only go to one person. But at the same time, I think Vikings fans will, will be fine with the award not going to Jefferson as long as he said his, his career continues to grow and continues to advance in the way that I, we're hopeful for at this point and, and for sure that that all makes a lot of sense so yeah anyways we just want to express our sincere thanks to, to brian from blitzology.com for for coming on uh our listeners should definitely check out his site and you can also find brian on twitter at blitzology blog uh brian is there anywhere else that listeners can find your work or any other things you want to plug uh no i mean that's the primary stuff uh, they're really interested in in uh you know the different Football things on Twitter. I post a lot of clips. I post clips every day with just little chances to look at what what's going on. So hopefully it's worthwhile for people. Um, it isn't all defensive stuff, and it isn't always blitz stuff on Twitter. Uh, on the actual website itself, the articles are a little bit more in depth. We get into a little bit more stuff. Obviously, Twitter is limited by what Twitter is. Um, so the articles tend to be um, you know a little more in depth. And then I'm always happy to answer questions. I get a lot of questions from a lot of different. Uh, constituency. Some of them are just fans or content creators or people who maybe don't know as much about football. The only way to learn football is spend time trying to learn football. So if you're interested in doing it, get out and find some things. And then my biggest advice that I would give to people that are interested in finding out more about football is try to understand the source that it's coming from. Does this person coach? Does this person put out meaningful content? There's some really good analysts out there. There are some also terrible analysts out there. And so it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you're just interested in opinions and stuff like that, certainly there's some entertaining podcasts out there that will give you some great opinions, you know. But there's also, from an X's and O perspective, things that you may not consider if you're not a coach, if you're not in the coaching world. There's a football element of Twitter that's really fascinating. There's a lot of really good coaches out there that you can learn stuff from. And I learn stuff from those guys every day. I mean, I learn something new about football all the time. And I think there's always something to add so there's a lot of that out there if you're willing to go look at it and find it if you're interested in that stuff um, and I think the biggest uh, thing to remember when you're watching football is that it's really difficult like what those guys are doing is really really difficult and so uh, I try to always keep that in mind as I think through what people are trying to do because it's uh, none of this stuff is an easy ass especially when the guy across the line from you is also really good and paid millions of dollars he's probably really good at it too so yeah no, thank absolutely. you so much Brian Thank yes. you. This is, I really appreciate perspective. Thank Thanks you. for having me, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Just want to thank Brian again for coming on. Super thankful for for him and his perspective, and that was just a fantastic conversation with him. Kyle, any like major takeaways you had from that interview? Yeah, so I think it's. I mean, I'm going to re first reiterate what Sam was saying. You know, my sincere thanks. Uh, we're both so appreciative of him taking time out of his day. And it wasn't just, um, I mean, he spoke with us for over an hour there, which was amazing. But I also know that he put in time studying film and, uh, you know, looking up stats and crunch numbers. And so just a thanks to him for being such a wonderful guest. Everyone, please be sure to, you know, if you're listening to this and if you're the Twitter type, go give him a follow and uh, check out his site. Um, but in terms of uh, takeaways, I think one of the most interesting things that he said 
which on the one hand is obvious, but the way that he framed it, I thought was good. And maybe and it made me kind of think about it in a different way was how, um, like the college system is the pipeline for talent and what college produces is what they produce. And that's really the only way that players come into the league. And so the coaches in a lot of ways kind of need to adapt to what the talent is. Uh, and so I thought that was a really neat point. Uh, and it's not to say that the coaches can't form and mold these guys and maybe, you know, develop different skill sets, but it's important to understand where the college game is at, where these players are at, what they do well, and um, to adjust the coaching to that. So I think that's very, very interesting, and it, it was a good point. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It was there was a lot of different takeaways that I had. That this is a guy that's obviously been around uh, and seen different systems and seen the way that yeah, like you said, these pipelines work, and it was quite eye opening to see the way that he brought brought all this in. And I think for me, it feels like. Obviously, every off season is important, and you never want to kind of like every off season is a chance for you to to make some decisions about the direction of the team. But I'm realizing that from what he was saying that this is a very important. It, it feels like so obvious, but it's a very important off season, and I feel like particularly because the Vikings are really making a choice for what the next couple of years is going to look like, particularly the next year. But there, there's some decisions that need to be made that will really direct uh, the what this team's going to do. And, and I know he had a lot of optimism, optimism about the team. And I love that. I love that he was able to do that. But I, uh, I think we're really hoping that, that next year that there's some moves that are made um, that really pay off. And, and we won't be able to know that until the season starts and, and gets underway next year. Yeah. 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 So that's, uh, that's it for us. We're, we're thankful for, for Brian for doing a lot of the talking and, getting getting a lot of, of really good analysis analysis and perspective in there um just as we wrap up our odds and ends we uh i've been talking about the minnesota wild and we finally have some hockey that's that's going to start uh unfortunately the Vikings season ends but the, the minnesota wild season begins and they with the nhl this year they've rearranged the the divisions um it's quite a quite an assortment and the Minnesota Wild really fit in interesting here because there's three top teams with the St. Louis Blues and the Avalanche in Colorado and the Vegas Golden Knights. And then there's five teams there that aren't super high-end teams. And and so I think that there's a real chance for the Minnesota Wild to sneak in with it. There's they, there's four playoff spots, and I think that fourth spot, is, there's definitely a chance there. And, and just looking at their schedule, they're playing every other night starting this coming Thursday, January 14th. They've got the Kings back to back. They've got Anaheim Ducks back to back. They've got the San Jose Sharks back to back, and then the Kings back to back again. And these are all teams that they're really competing for for that fourth and final playoff spot. And with a smaller season, I think that this is these first eight games are going to be really crucial for them uh, in the way that they start the season. That's interesting because I like I know, I mean Sam knows more about hockey than I do, but you know. Obviously, you want to see your team get off to a strong start, especially if there's an outside chance that maybe they could squeak into the playoffs and get that valuable experience. I think the Kings games are going to be really interesting because I think, if I'm not mistaken, Sam can correct me, but I think LA has a really good prospect pool. Like, I think they've got some really kind of high end talent. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, like where Minnesota is maybe pretty thin at center and at forward, I think LA has some really top notch talent at that position. So it'll just be kind of fascinating to see two teams who are trying to bounce back and grow and build and maybe have different areas of strength uh, kind of, you know, squaring off right right from the get-go. It should be fun for Wild fans. 100%. The Kings are definitely one of the top teams in terms of the prospect pool. I know some, everyone's got different rankings, uh, but but they're very much at the top, and it'll be interesting to see who makes it out of camp. But I think that regardless, these games are going to be a lot of fun. And I think that... Uh, it will just be a fascinating season. So looking forward to, to checking in uh, every couple of weeks and seeing where they're at and, and how they're doing. Kyle, any, any words of wisdom for our, for our group? And hopefully it's, it's good because we've got a couple of weeks of, of break between, between this episode and next. Right. Yeah. So the words of wisdom I was thinking was I got to, I, I was silly and I didn't go back and like fully read these chapters. But the one that I was thinking of, I was thinking of Solomon uh, building the temple. Uh, for Israel, and so that's you know a big deal in uh, in the Christian story. 
Uh, and so if I'm not mistaken, Solomon, he, uh, he puts different folks up to uh, various tasks and he chooses very skilled laborers, folks who are good at different things and kind of puts it on their shoulders to uh, fulfill these tasks. And so uh, the point is uh, that it can be good to uh, surround yourself with folks who do excellent work, do great stuff. Um, there's benefit in that. And so this is basically my way of bringing it around to, in some sort of loosely connected manner, to Brian in that he is certainly, I think, for myself, I think Sam would say the same, He's further along in his understanding of football than we are. He is smarter with the game than we are. And we benefited from having him and his expertise. Uh, and that's, I think, just basically, generally speaking, a good way to approach things in life. If you're working on something, you're doing a project. And if you have access to folks who are excellent at what they do, then it's a good thing to bring them into the fold. And, uh, and you can grow and benefit from that. A hundred percent. No, I, for sure. He was super knowledgeable. And I think that this is something that we want to, to prioritize is getting some quality people on here to, to break it down and yes. to add to the conversation. And speaking of that, we actually have a, another guest coming up for our next week or our next episode that will be happening in two weeks. We won't say the name. We'll keep it a secret, a little bit of suspense, right. uh, but we'll be releasing that in, in two weeks time from, from when we release this. And we're looking forward to that too. And I think that from our conversation with Ryan, we really focused in on the defensive end of the ball. And I think this conversation will focus a little bit more into offense. Yeah, there's going to be some offensive talk. And like Sam's saying, we won't mention names or anything like that, but there'll be some offense. And then there'll be some talk of the draft and prospects. And so if you're out there grinding mock drafts, reading about the mock drafts, uh, this could be the episode for you. Yeah, and I'm I'm super looking forward to that. I think the draft's a fascinating position. Room. Yes. It's a fascinating process, and especially this year. I think that, like you said, we've, we've got the 14th pick, but then without a second-round pick, there's a lot of different possibilities. And with such a unique situation that, that they're in, I think that it'll be fascinating to see the decisions that are made around that. So looking forward to that conversation and looking forward to, to releasing that. Thanks for checking in. Hope you guys enjoyed the interview and we will connect with you all in a couple of weeks time. Thanks so much.